So we will begin. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavari Paschacya Desha Tarine Vancha Kaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hari Hari. So nice to be with you all again for our Bhakti Shastri. And we're continuing here with Chapter 5. Everyone can see the screen okay? Yes, my Good. Right, so we'll let's see the first we covered these two sections in the last class we explained how karma yoga was greater than karma sannyas in other words it's much better to be engaged in some activity than to try to stop activities to try to give up activities it's better to do something and then, the, then Lord Krishna went on to describe about how we could do karma yoga in a detached manner at the, and at the same time have the knowledge of the jnani. In other words, uh, seeing things in the, with the vision of the jnani, seeing everyone as a spirit soul and seeing Lord Krishna behind everything. So detachment was there. Understanding, we're not the doer. So we'll go on today, we're going to discuss about this important point here, the relationship between the Ishwara, the Jiva and the Prakriti. So this is actually a discussion more about who is the doer. Because the question comes up, who's responsible? Is it due to the Ishwara, due to the Krishna, the Supreme Controller, or the living entity, is he responsible, or is it material nature which is responsible? And so this relationship is a, an important discussion here in the fifth chapter. And then the chapter goes on to explain about the vision of the Jnani, Brahma Jnani, and Paramatma Vadi, different visions. The Brahma Jnani, seeing everything as Brahman. Paramatma Vadi, seeing everything as Paramatma. And then there's a couple of verses which are about Dhyana Yoga because the next chapter, chapter 6, is describing Dhyana Yoga. And Lord Krishna brings in a couple of verses into this chapter to introduce us to the subtopic of meditation. Because you've come to the platform of Paramatma Vadi, so a natural thing to do if you realize that Paramatma, and you understand Paramatma is there, you may want to meditate on it. So Lord Krishna is going to speak about this Jnana Yoga. And then at the end, the final verse is the peace formula. 
which is a well-known verse, the concluding verse of the fifth chapter. All right, so going ahead, here is verse number 13. When the embodied living being controls his nature and mentally renounces all actions, he resides happily in the city of nine gates, a material body, neither working nor causing work to be done. To, is to, to see Krishna Priyamataji here today? Krishna Premi? Krishna Priya. Is Tosi Krishna Priya here today? Uh, wait, Maharaj. No, Maharaj. Uh, I, I is not good, Maharaj. Tosi Krishna Mataji's health is not good. Or health oh. is yeah. really? No, we're sorry to hear that. So we hope she recovers soon. Okay, so Krishna Premi Mataji, you can tell us how, how what are the nine gates of What's being referred to? The city of nine gates. And what are the nine gates? Oh. <laughs> yes. The nine gates. You're not sure? Anyway, uh, we're told anyway that the city, the city is the material body, right? The city means the material body. So in the material body there are nine gates. Can you guess what are the nine gates of the body? Is it the mind? No, mind is not a gate. In the material body, physical body, we've got gates. Okay. Yeah, we, we've got... Oh, uh, is it the eyes? The yes, nose? we've got two uh, eyes, right? Uh -huh. And the nose, we've got nose. two nostrils. And the mouth? And the mouth, okay. There's five. Have you got any other gates? Uh, is it the nostril? The uh, nose is nostrils. The nostrils? Yeah, we said the nostril. We said the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, and also... The anus? Yeah, anus is one. Mm. Three more. Yeah, you missed you missed obvious one on the head. We've got also two. A genitals. Yeah, genitals is one. Okay, and then also you missed two. There's two which are there on the head. Yes. Yes, right. The two ears. Okay. Well done. So we've got the nine gates. And we have yeah, to. Thank you, Maharaj. We have to. We want to reside happily in the city of nine gates. So it's important to keep these gates. Uh, we know the health of the body is very much connected with these gates. If any of these gates become blocked up or we have some problems, it will affect our health. So, anyway, Lord Krishna is describing here that we have to control our nature, mentally renounce all action. So this implies detachment, right? You should, we can't be attached to our action, controlling our nature. We may have some you know, particular nature, but we have to control that and mentally renounce all actions and reside happily in the material body. 
And how can we be happy in this material body? Well, Lord Krishna says, neither working nor causing work to be done. No, so that's nice. You don't, you're not working. <laughs> it's a good reason to be happy, right? And not, not causing work to be done. In this way, we can reside happily in the material body. Okay? The cause of suffering. So, we ask our students here today, who is responsible for the suffering of the living entities? You have to read these verses. Chapter 4, text number 14, and then chapter 5, verse number 14 also, and 15. So, we'll give you five minutes, look over these purports, and see if you can pick out some references or analogies from the purports to describe who is responsible for the suffering of the living entities. Yeah, we're, we're suffering, or we could say who's responsible for the enjoyment or the happiness of the living entities. Not all suffering, but certainly a lot of suffering is there. Happiness is only very, very little. Most of it's suffering. All right, so take five minutes, look through these purports, see if you can pick out some uh, references or statements.
All right. So, would someone like to tell me some nice uh, analogies or statements which are there in 414 and what is being explained? Arash, there is an analogy of rain falling on uh, the earth. So, the rain is responsible for the vegetation, but it's not responsible for what grows. Uh, so, with that analogy, we can understand that the Lord is cause of everything, but you know what the outcomes, what different vegetations are producing, it's not responsibility of the Lord. It depends on the soul rather, that how they are acting and uh, how they are entangled. And from there, uh, the response is reaction and adverse reaction occurs. So for suffering, the living entity's desires is, is, is responsible, not the Lord. Okay, so this one example. Yes, Prabhu. And uh, Maharaj, second thing uh, that Prabhu says in that purport is about like the uh, there is an owner and then there are people who are working under him. So if a worker is doing something uh, wrong or right, so it is not the responsibility of the uh, owner. It is their own uh, responsibility if they are doing something right and wrong. Although uh, the owner is the owner. It is one more example that uh, Prabhupada gives there. Yes, yes, right. The living entity is responsible. The owner can, it's not that Krishna is responsible for it's the activities, right? Okay. So Any one more point there, one more point there, Maharaj. Yes. Because, because the owner of the Lord has not ordained these activities. Those are not per being performed by the will of the Lord. That's why the Lord is not responsible. Well, because the Lord didn't order them to do it. Yes. So if you perform anything, even in the material world, ordered by the Lord, then you will not be, you will get free from those things. Okay. Yes. So many nice analogies. Prabhupada was giving several, three analogies there, just in that one purport. All to show that the Lord is not responsible for the suffering of the living entity. Okay, and did you get a chance to read over chapter 5, text 14, 15? 14, then Maharaj. Maharaj, there is one more analogy in 15 which I have. Where, uh, in, the fourth, is saying, in the fourth chapter? Fifth chapter, Maharaj. Fifth chapter, okay. Where, uh, Prabhupada is saying just like, uh, so uh, basically, uh, the living entity, he gets bewildered by the desires and Lord allows him to fulfill his desire, but he is never responsible. And uh, this is because uh, Super Soul is sitting uh, with the Jeeva. And just like uh, the smell of the flower can be taken if someone is nearby, so Lord can sense what desires a living entity has. And that is why he allows or disallows to fulfill them, but he is not responsible for the actions. All right. Yes. The, the Lord consents the desire of the living entity. Just like the aroma of the flower. If you're near the flower. Okay. Good. Maharaj in 14, uh, Prabhupada says, very clearly that the temporary body or material dwelling place which he obtains is the cause of varieties of activities and their resultant reactions. So, scripture there basically says that also the living entities, they don't create the activities or they don't induce people to act. Right? Uh, Lord is not responsible previously, now even living entities don't create things. But it's just because they want to, uh, you know, Prabhupada gives very one wonderful statement. Their propensity to enjoy the uh, propensity for lording over material resources. Their propensity, and because of which they have accepted this temporary body, that is causing various varieties of activities and resulting actions because of the three modes of material. And he gives the city of, uh, again, the nine city, uh, city of the body. Right? As long as this analogy Prabhupada gives, city of the body, as long as the human assumes that he is the master. That's the problem, but actually, 
the master, he is not the master, not the controller of this uh, city of the uh, city of the world. So who is responsible for the suffering? The modes of nature are responsible. Our our attachment, our attachment, our our, our propensity to for lording over it over the material resources, that propensity, our attachment, our under our thinking that we are the master, that is the problem. No one is responsible for uh, anything. Only our our attachment or our ignorance, according to five point one five, our ignorance of our actual position. That's the responsibility. That's the responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And is there anything from text step 15? Arash, there is one more analogy which uh, Prabhupada gives from one of the Upanishads. He says that uh, just like a cloud is driven uh, by the air, so similarly a living entity is completely dependent either in his distress or happiness on the Lord. So by the will of the Supreme, he can either go to heaven or hell. So, it's complete dependence on the Lord. Oh. Yes, that's, that's the quote, right? It's a Sanskrit verse there. Yes. <laughs> By the will of the Supreme, he can go to heaven or hell, as a cloud is driven by the air. So it would appear like the Lord is responsible there. So here actually is... Uh, because of the bewildered state, uh, the living entity desires something which is wrong and is eventually driven to hell. But the, it, it says the living entity is completely dependent in his distress and happiness. That is Maharaj, Prabhupada says that is when he desires Krishna. When, when one desires Krishna, the Lord takes special care and all these things will happen. And then it says earlier, the Lord engages the living entity in pious activities so that he may be elevated. The Lord engages him in impious activities so that he may go to hell. So it would appear like the Lord is responsible there. Just for one more sentence back, Maharaj. However, when one desires Krishna, the Lord takes special care and then makes one can attain to him to be eternally happy. So it's basically desire, depending on our desire. So just before this, uh, there is this statement also, Maharaj, where they said, uh, man proposes and God disposes. So whatever proposal a man would put, only that disposition he will have to take. Mm -hmm. Sanctioned by the Lord. Uh -huh. Also, Maharaj, it is mentioned in uh, the 15th of uh, 5.15 about uh, the Lord is constant companion and therefore he can understand the desire of the individual soul. So, Lord uh, fulfills his desire as he deserves. Yes, certainly from the verse, because in the verse, text number 5, chapter 5.15, nor does the Supreme Lord assume anyone's sinful or pious activities. Embodied beings, however, are bewildered because of the ignorance which covers their real knowledge. So we see very clearly, anyway, Krishna is not going to take the responsibility. Although these statements are there in the scriptures which seem to indicate the Lord is responsible, but on the basis of this verse, it's clear the Lord is not going to take responsibility. So we may say, well, the Lord is not going to take responsibility. We may think the material nature itself must be responsible. And of course, there is that other well-known verse, Prakriti Kriyamanani Gunai Karmani Sarvasha. The bewildered spirit soul thinks himself to be the doer of activities which are carried out by material nature. So it would appear that the material nature is a doer. But then if the material nature is a doer, then what's the problem with that argument? Maharaj, then I can 
uh, then the living entity is, is like they, they do wrong things and then they blame the material nature for it in the sense I kill someone and say that you know it, I was in the mode of ignorance not take responsibility myself for it Yeah. Yeah. So uh, actually, Maras. So the living entity is actually not potent to do that, right? So he cannot manipulate the uh, material nature to that extent. That's why material nature does it for him, only on his desire and on the uh, approval of super soul according to his desires. This happens. But desire is coming from the uh, individual soul. Everything is just facilitated by uh, Krishna and the material nature. Material nature is actually the doer. Krishna is approving and presenting. Yes, everything is enacted through the modes of material nature. And Lord Krishna, he is overseer and sanctioning. And the living entity, he's the initiator of, by his desire. The desire of the living entity. If the material nature was responsible, now how could material nature be responsible Responsible when it's inert matter? We cannot say it's all due to material energy, it's just the cause, all caused by material energy. That Nobody's going to accept that. And so if we argue that most of material nature was just the material nature, they, they just did it, I'm just a... God, I'm just on the machine of the material nature, and material nature acted like that. Of course, we can never escape in the court of justice. We can never pass the responsibility off to the material nature. And similarly, we see also in, in the scriptures, there are so many injunctions, scriptural injunctions. If the material nature was responsible, then there would be no need for Lord Krishna to give these injunctions. Lord Krishna, if you do this, you'll go there. If you do that, you'll go there. But there would be no need of saying that, because if it's all done by material nature, then the living entity himself is he's, he's nothing to do, he's independent. So the instructions are given there to guide the living entity so that he will properly desire. Okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead. Let's see here. Text 14. The embodied spirit, master of the city of this body, does not create activities, nor does he induce people to act, nor does he create the fruits of action. All this is enacted by the modes of material nature. So it would appear from this verse, material nature is responsible. The, spirit, the, the embodied spirit doesn't do anything, he doesn't create activity, he doesn't induce people to act, and he doesn't create the fruits of action. So in so many ways, the living entity is not doing anything, and, but we're saying it's all done by the material nature. And so we could argue material nature is responsible, but material nature is just inert matter. How can it be responsible? What caused the material nature to act in that way? That has to be understood. And what is the purpose of the laws of Shastra? Why are we given laws of Shastra? The laws of Shastra are not just for the modes of nature. Srila Prabhupada explains, as soon as the living entity becomes aloof from the activities of the body, he becomes free from the reactions as well. As long as he is in the city of the body, he appears to be the master of it, but actually he is neither its proprietor nor controller of its actions and reactions. He is simply in the midst of the material ocean struggling for existence. The waves of the ocean are tossing him and he has no control over them. His best solution is to get out of the water by transcendental Krishna consciousness. That alone will save him from all turmoil. 
So the material, the material existence like, is like an ocean, and certainly material existence, existence can be very turbulent, just like in the ocean, the waves are tossing him. Prabhupada saw going in the boat, crossing the ocean. You have no control. You're just in the boat. And the waves are coming. Sometimes the boat is going up and down. You have no control. What can you do? The best it's the only thing to try to get out of the water. So this is Krishna consciousness. And then text 15. Nor does the Supreme Lord assume anyone's sinful or pious activities. Embodied beings, however, are bewildered because of the ignorance which covers their real knowledge. So our real knowledge is there. What could we see? Where, where is the real knowledge of the living entity? Where is that? Embodied beings, we are all embodied souls and we are bewildered because of the ignorance which covers our real knowledge. Yes, please comment. In Prabhupada Maharaj said, uh, um, the knowledge is, uh, is to know that we are a servant of Krishna to know that Jivere Swarupa is the Krishna Das. So this is what uh, Prabhupada said in, in his lecture. So where is that consciousness? It's just covered, Maharaj. It's there. It's just covered. It's there. What it's what is covered? Satchidananda, the Satchidananda, our original nature. Yes, the soul, the soul, the the soul is Satchidananda. So the soul is in full knowledge, the soul is in real knowledge, but because of our ignorance, our spiritual nature is covered. So we identify with the body. So this is ajnana, ajnana pritam jnanam tena muyanti jantavaha. Okay, so we're covered. The Lord neither hates nor likes anyone. Though he appears to, from the Vedanta Sutra and quoted in the purport of 515, certainly it appears that Krishna likes somebody, he doesn't like others. Give some examples. Can you give an example of how Krishna shows he, it, it appears he likes someone, he doesn't like somebody else? Like whenever uh, there is a fight between demons and demigods, like Lord Krishna will take on the sides of the demigods. Yes. Yeah, so although like uh, uh, the actually demons don't approach Lord Vishnu, demigods they approach Lord Vishnu, so Lord Vishnu helps them. So although it appears that uh, Lord Vishnu is taking sides, but he is not taking sides. Whoever approached him, he is just helping them. Yes, right. Good. What about in our own life, in our own living, our, our own times, in our own environment? Do you ever, do you ever feel like it, it appears uh, Krishna really likes that person, and maybe he doesn't like somebody else? Maybe you know, we say about this person, we may say, oh, oh he, we may say he's got good karma, or somebody else has got bad karma. Or we could simply say, it appears Krishna really likes this person. You know, maybe he likes this person. Everything he touches may turn to gold. You know, he's very successful financially. He has no economic problems. He has everything. You know, he's doing very well in the material world. So we may say, oh, Krishna really likes that person. And someone else is having a really hard time. They're really struggling, so many difficulties, so many problems, health problems, economic problems, 
political problems, everything going wrong. So it appears Krishna really doesn't like this person. So like that, it appears like that. But actually, Krishna, he doesn't hate anybody and he doesn't like anyone. What's his position? How do we explain it? The position of Lord Krishna in relation to the living entities? Maintainer, benefactor and so it appears like he's a, it appears like he forgets some people, you know. Some people they seem to do okay by the grace of Krishna and other people they have a really hard time. So is it Krishna forgets them? Actually Krishna's position is so renowned Sarvabhutana. Yes. Seemingly, it's because of his own karmas that one is suffering. That's Krishna's right. Krishna's original purism is Suridam. Yes. Krishna Maharaj, uh, Prabhupada is mentioning that Prabhupada, uh, Krishna is neutral. Yes, he's neutral. Uh, it's like he is saying to everyone, it's, it's, it's based on karmas that we are suffering. Yeah, everyone, they get, they get the results of their karma, right? Just like the example was given the, the judge in the court of law. The judge, he puts someone in jail and somebody else, he gives them a big amount of money as compensation. And the man came into the court and he was injured in the job, working. And so the judge gives him compensation, he orders the company. You have to pay this worker 10 lakhs. He got injured, serious injury. Company should compensate him. And then somebody else comes into the court and the judge orders this man, or he put him in jail, hard labor for 10 years. So the prisoner will say, yeah, you put me in the jail for 10 years to do hard labor and you give the other man 10 lakhs? He said, you should be, you know why you, get, you, get, you reward him and you punish me? So it appears, like that, sometimes like that, it appears somebody is being punished, but actually Krishna is equal to everyone, as you're saying, he's equal to everyone. Just like the judge is neutral, it's not that the judge is partial to one person and doesn't like another. He's equal to everybody, but according to their work, according to their activity, somebody's punished and someone's rewarded. All right, so from the purport, 515, the Sanskrit word vibhu means the Supreme Lord who is full of unlimited knowledge, riches, strength, fame, beauty and renunciation. He is always satisfied in himself, undisturbed by sinful or pious activities. He does not create a particular situation for any living entity, but the living entity, bewildered by ignorance, desires to be put into certain, certain conditions of life, and thereby his chain of action and reaction begins. So I've, as you've been pointing out, the living entity desires to be put into certain conditions of life desires due to his ignorance. He desires to be put into these different conditions. And this begins the chain of action and reaction. Prabhupada explains, just like a thief, he's praying to God, my dear Lord, give me some opportunity. I can steal that thing. Krishna first of all says, no, no, don't do it, but he insists. Then Krishna says, all right, do it, but as soon as you do it, you become entangled. Why you are doing against the will of Krishna, that is your entanglement. Krishna is giving you facility to steal others' property, but you become entangled. 
That is not Krishna's responsibility. Your responsibility. So in this way, Prabhupada's explaining the position of the living entity, that Krishna gives us that free will. What are we going to do? We have to recognize our responsibility. We shouldn't go against the will of Krishna. We have to know what is the will of Krishna. And Krishna is trying to help us, giving us direction. We have to be willing to take some uh, direction from him. So this is our position. Oh, this is from 13th chapter now. 13th chapter, text 23. He can give you permission, but the enjoyment and suffering will have to be taken by you. You insist, permission, I want to do this, and without permission you cannot do it. Therefore Krishna gives you permission. All right, you do it, but at your risk. Krishna does not want that you should do it, but you want to do it. Therefore, he gives permission. Just like sometimes we see the young boy at home, he wants to smoke cigarettes. And the father may say, no, no, please don't do it. Or it might be that the young boy wants to drink, he wants to take alcohol. And the father will say, no, no, don't do it. You'll waste so much money, it's very bad for your health, it's very dangerous, you better not do it. So then, what to do. So the, when the, the father's telling the boy don't do it but then the boy's insisting and finally the boy grows up and is at that age where he doesn't take instructions from the father anymore. So what can the father do? So all right you do it at your own risk. So the same way Lord Krishna is acting on the heart of the living entity. He, he, he gives us direction, but we don't want to do it. And therefore, he gives permission. But the suffering, that is for us. You have to, we have to accept the suffering. Hare Krishna Maharaji. Yes? Maharaji, in material world, like uh, we see in, in today's scenario, even father himself gives bottle uh, the, in the hands of their children. Then the reactions will go to the children's, children's part or it will go to the uh, father part. Because uh, in, the, in the childhood, uh, a child or a, a person may not be aware of this Jnana, Bhagavad Gita and, and all this knowledge, transcendental knowledge then uh, the sinful reaction will go to the father's part or it will be to, to the child's part because I am also one of the victims that I, I ate uh, non-veg in my childhood uh, and uh, but till that time I was not aware of yes but it was like it was coming and I was eating yes uh... Well, there's some, some karma will be there, certainly. We're in one family, but karma is there. You live together, you eat the food together, you have to take karma, for sure. The, the laws of material nature, of course, is very, it's very intricate, it's not clear exactly how much karma or where the karma comes, but certainly some karmic reactions are there. First of all, we take birth in a family because of karma. We're put together, we're put into that family. It's a result, so it's not by chance. It's karma which brings us together. We take birth in that particular family and then we're brought up to eat that particular kind of food. You know, this is not just by chance, this is a karma from past life, it puts us together. 
then we have to understand what is proper. So, as we grow up, we become a bit more thoughtful and we consider more carefully, is it good or is it not good? And we have to, we want to change, we want to get away from the family. Of course, sometimes it's very difficult. The family don't, you know, why you go away? You don't want the family, you don't want your family, you want to go away from your family, your mother and father and like that. What can be done? <laughs> it's a difficult situation. The laws of karma are there. Fortunately, uh, due to Vaishnav's association, I was able to leave very in the early stage, otherwise it would, it would be very late. Okay, then, yeah, you were lucky. You were able, you recognized the situation and you managed to get out of it. Yes, but... Anyway, Krishna is mentioned here in Bhagavad Gita. How is the Super Soul described? In 13th chapter, is it? The Upadrashta and the Anumanta. So here you have Anumanta. Upadrashta, the overseer, and Anumanta, the permitter. So he gives permission. Anumanta, the, over, the super soul is the overseer and the permitter. So he's directing us. He gives us also, we know, uh, 15th verse or 15th chapter also. Uh, Mataksmitir dhyanam apohanam cha. He gives knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. So just like you said, you got, you got, you were able to get out of your situation at an early stage in life. Why? That's by the grace of the super soul. He gave us re remembrance of the situation, and you were able to do something, take, take some action against it to get out of the situation. Okay, we'll go ahead. So, uh, Maharaj, that remembrance also will be due to our karma or by Krishna's mercy or uh, how that works? Yes, well, and also based on the living entity's own desire, and how much do we actually desire to get out of that situation? The Lord is there in the heart. He, he could give us that remembrance. Maybe He's giving us that remembrance, but are we hearing it? That's, yes. a, that's a point, you see. He can be giving the remembrance as a super soul. He's helping us to remember if we want to remember. So He knows the desire because the super soul seated right in the heart next to the soul. So He knows the desire of the living entity. So according to the desire of the living entity, he will give remembrance, knowledge or forgetfulness. So it's really going to come from us, not just simply the mercy of Krishna, not just causeless mercy. Causeless mercy, that comes from Krishna's devotees, Krishna's pure devotees. But the super soul, he knows the desire of the individual living entity and he will act on the heart according to what we actually desire. If we really want to remember, then the super soul will help us. But if, we're in if we don't really care, he will allow us to forget so we can enjoy it the material situation. Okay? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. So, punishment by the Lord is a favor. We don't always appreciate this when we're being punished, that it's really a favor. Let's read what Prabhupada has to say. The impious and the non-devotees 
are against the principles of the Vedas. So such persons are always hampered from making advances in their nefarious activities. Some of them who are specially favoured by the Lord are killed by him personally, as in the cases of Ravan, Haranyakashipu, Kams, etc. And thus such demons get salvation and are thereby checked from further progress in their demonic activities. Just like a kind father, either in his favour upon the devotees or his punishment of the demons, he is ever kind to everyone because he is the complete existence for all individual existence. There's a Prabhupada conversation, right? He is, he is ever kind to everyone because he is the complete existence for all individual existence. So he's ever kind. We have to see whatever happens. Or, or Prabhupada's giving the example, Krishna killing the demons, this kindness, the demons are going to get liberated. And somebody else is punished in a different way, but that punishment is also kindness because it takes away the bad karma. You use up the bad karma and then you can have better karma. Going ahead to text 16. When, however, one is enlightened with the knowledge by which nescience is destroyed, then his knowledge reveals everything as the sun lights up everything in the daytime. So the example of the sun is often given. The sun lights up everything. So the sun is like knowledge. His knowledge reveals everything, just like the sun. And ignorance is like darkness. Ignorance is, is nishans. Ignorance. We simply see the material body. We want to note here. Oh, sorry. In the purport there, text 16. Prabhupada describing about the misunderstanding of the impersonalists. Because how do the impersonalists consider liberation? What is their thinking about actual knowledge? How does an impersonalist, what, what, for an impersonalist, what is actually their goal, their perfection? To reach the Brahma Jyoti. Yes, right. Is... To reach the Brahma Jyoti. So what is their knowledge? Their knowledge is that the Lord is formless. It's just a bright light and their goal is to merge into that bright effulgence. Okay, so how do they consider their own self? They, uh, they are also... Uh, particles and they want to merge in, in the Lord, like. Okay, and how do they see the Lord then? Someone who has no form, someone who uh, just when he uh, comes to the material world, then he has form sometimes and sometimes they feel that he is just somebody who has no form at all. He's completely void. Hirakar and uh, Shunyavar, like some, some of them feel he is void, some of them they are like no form at all. So how do they consider Lord Krishna when he comes in the world? They consider him to be like, uh, uh, some of them consider him to be like one of them. Some of them consider him to be like, uh, just like he has assumed the material form while he is in the material world. Oh, Lord Krishna has assumed a material form. And what happens when he's not in the material world? Where does he go? He's just formless. There's no... He, he doesn't have existence. He's just nirakar. There's no form. There's no akar. There's no shape. 
So where does he go? He's just a, he's just a, some supreme energy. So where where will he be situated? The personal Brahman Maharaj, like uh, Prabhupada gives example of this Ghatakas, Patakas, like the small sky in the form and merges in the bigger sky. So there is no existence. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, let's see what Prabhupada says. From the purport of text 16, one has to learn the distinction between God and the living entity. Lord Sri Krishna, therefore, stated in the second chapter, 2.12, that every living being is individual. Right? What's the verse? Who knows 2.12? Yeah. Translation? There was never a time when all of these things existed, I existed, you existed, and there will never be a time in the future. And oh. we all exist now also. Okay, good. Yes. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future will we ever cease to be. So every living being is individual, and the Lord also is individual. They were all individuals in the past, they are individuals at present, and they will continue to be individuals in the future even after liberation. At night we see everything as one in the darkness, but in daytime when the sun is up, we see everything in its real identity. Identity with individuality in spiritual life is real knowledge. So this is not of course accepted by the Mayavadis, impersonalists, they won't talk like this. But this is how we explain, according to Bhagavad Gita. Real knowledge can be obtained from a person who is in perfect Krishna consciousness. Therefore, one has to seek out such a bona fide spiritual master and under him learn what Krishna consciousness is. For Krishna consciousness will certainly drive away all nations as the sun drives away darkness. So the sun. Krishna Surya Sam, Maya Haya Andhika. Krishna is like the sun and Maya is like darkness. Where there is Krishna, there can be no Maya. Where there's the sun, there's no question of darkness. So this is the glory of knowledge transcendental knowledge. Where there is this real knowledge, then we will not be bewildered by the material energy. Okay? And here, from text number 17, because text 17 is going on to describe about this Paramatma vision, the jnanis who desire knowledge of paramatma. We want to understand the nature of the paramatma and we take to devotional service. So text number 17 describes like that. And you can see these different terms are there in the verse. Tat buddhaya, tat atmana, tat nishtaha, tat parayana. Hmm. Meaning, The verse. Yeah. When your intelligence, mind, and when your intelligence, mind, faith, and refuge are all fixed in the Supreme, then one becomes fully cleansed of misgivings through complete knowledge and then proceeds straight on the path of liberation. So, when your intelligence, 
first he speaks about intelligence and then the mind and then faith and then finally refuge those who have taken complete shelter so first of all intelligence intelligence is always in the supreme of course intelligence is supreme in the subtle body higher than the mind is intelligence and intelligence is seated next to the soul so those whose intelligence is in the supreme and then the mind those whose minds are always in the supreme and faith those whose faith is only meant for the supreme and then tatparayanaha who have taken complete shelter of him and that means engaging in hearing and chanting process so this way we come to understand the Paramatma through devotional service. We come to understand the Paramatma. And Prabhupada goes on, text 18, a more well known verse describing the vision of the Paramatma Vyadi. Here we see the equal vision of a Jnani. Right? It's a well-known verse. Vijabhinaya. Vijabhinaya Sampani. Vijabhinaya. Uh, vidya meaning education and Vinaya gentleness. I remember uh, Bhakti Charu Swami one time mentioned about this verse. He was talking, he said, Vidya Vinaya, the qualities of a Brahman, that generally a Brahman should be a symbol of these qualities, Vidya and Vinaya. He should be both learned and at the same time he should be gentle. So, you know, not every Brahmana is quite like that, but actually this is a very nice description of the Brahmana, these qualities which we can appreciate. So we describe here, because the Paramatma Vyadi is describing, he sees with an equal vision the learned and gentle Brahmana, a cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog eater. And so he, in this way he's covered the three different modes of nature. Because the cow and the brahmana, they're symbols of the mode of goodness. And the elephant is more a rajasic creature. Powerful, strong. And the dog and the dog eater, they're really the mode of ignorance. So the three modes are covered by this one verse and all the living entities are described as equal because within them all is the Paramatma. So one, one who can see with that equal vision then he is uh, Samo Pandita Darshana. He's a Pandit. He's a learned person. So this is the vision of the Jnani, to see with equality. Here's a quote from the ninth chapter, text number 11. A devotee should see that because Krishna is present in everyone's heart as Paramatma, every body is the embodiment or the temple of the Supreme Lord. So as one offers respect to the temple of the Lord, 
he should similarly properly respect each and every body in which the Paramatma dwells. Everyone should therefore be given proper respect and should not be neglected. So this is the ideal behavior and vision of a devotee, that we see each and every living entity as part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, and we offer respects to them. Prabhupada taught us to respect even the tiny creatures, the tiny insects. We should respect them. We should think how to give them Krishna consciousness. At the same time, there's a time and a place for everything. <laughs> if there was a cockroach in the kitchen, sometimes Prabhupada would just pick it up and throw it out the window and say, go out there and enjoy. <laughs> he wouldn't just let the cockroaches run around the kitchen and eat everything and contaminate everything. No, we have to keep everything clean. At the same time, theoretically, we should understand the presence of the Super Soul in the heart of every living entity. We don't try to embrace a tiger. We may embrace the, the devotee, but we don't embrace the tiger. If you do, then you're going to get trouble. We may understand the super soul is also there in the heart of the tiger. At the same time, we have to deal appropriately with the living entity according to the body in which they're in. Sometimes people argue, why can't my dog come in the temple? You know, you're supposed to be equal to everyone. Why can't my dog come in the temple? Sometimes people don't understand. We're not against dogs, but we don't bring them in the temple. We can give them prasadam. I mean, oh, Shiva and Nanda saying, give mercy to the dog. But it doesn't mean we just let the dogs come everywhere and come through the temple. There has to be some proper standards. So proper respect that should, should be taken into consideration according to the particular body. Self-intelligence, stira buddhi, self-intelligent. We want to get that kind of this kind of intelligence. Going ahead here, this text number twenty. He knows perfectly well that he is not this body, but is a fragmental portion of the supreme personality of Godhead. He is therefore not joyful in achieving something, nor does he lament in losing anything which is related to his body. This steadiness of mind is called stira buddhi or self-intelligent. So we can see this is moving on to a higher level of Krishna consciousness. Just a minute, we skipped a few verses. Let me just see what verses we skipped here. Alright, we did text 18 was describing the equal vision of the devotee. And then text 19 describes those whose minds are established in sameness and equanimity have already conquered the conditions of birth and death. They are actually Brahman. They are actually flawless like Brahman, and thus they 
already they are already situated in Brahman. All right. So if that text 19 was describing the devotee coming to the platform of Brahman, established in sameness and equanimity, certainly to see everybody equally like that, you'd have to be on that platform, equanimity of mind, strong control over the mind. And then text number 20 here, describing the sthita buddhi. A person who neither rejoices upon achieving something pleasant, nor laments upon attaining something unpleasant, who is self-intelligent, who is unbewildered, and who knows the science of God, is already situated in transcendence. So to be situated in transcendence, we can see this is a, not an easy thing to come to this position. We know that we're not the body, we know that we're part of the Supreme Lord, but it doesn't mean that if we achieve something, it doesn't mean we won't feel pleasure, certainly we'll feel joyful. And certainly when we lose something, we will also lament something related to our body. We have to lose it, and then certainly there will be lamentation. But one who can be steady in that situation, then that's intelligence. You can see the path of Gyan being described here. Stira buddhi, self-intelligent. Why should we lament or why should we rejoice? Because we've simply achieved something which is temporary, something which is material. We've achieved something. What have we achieved? What can we achieve in the material world? Simply some temporary thing will be given to us for some time and it will cause us attachment. We, we, if we rejoice, we're rejoicing because we're attached to it. And when we lose it, then we lament. We lament because of our attachment. But actually we should rejoice. Something is taken from us. We should think, Krishna is very merciful. He took it away from me took away my attachment. So this kind of control of the mind is required, self-intelligent, not to be disturbed in different situations. How does one attain sthita buddhi is explained in the next verse. Okay, so we'll go on to text 21 and we'll see how we can attain sthita Stira Buddhi. Text 21. Such a liberated person is not attracted to material sense pleasure, but is always in trance, enjoying the pleasures within. In this way, the self realized person enjoys unlimited happiness, for he concentrates on the Supreme. So we can, we can understand how to attain sthita buddhi. We have to become indifferent to, to sense pleasure. And that process is achieved by being in trance, enjoying the pleasure within.
and the pleasure within means concentrating on the Supreme Lord. So you can see how the chapters leading up to meditation on the Supreme Lord, on the Super Soul within, we contemplate this, the pleasure within, the pleasure of the soul. We don't think about the pleasure of the body. That is real pleasure. Of course, we have to overcome the pleasures of the material body. So how to do that? Oh, here the, from text 21, describing how to get this position. Bayas Parshish Vasaktatma, one who is not attached to external sense pleasure. And Brahma Yoga Yuktatma, one who is absorbed in the loving service of the Lord. So these two things, they go together. One who is not attached to sense pleasure. How will we become detached from sense pleasure? We have to become absorbed in the service of the Lord. Without taking up service to the Lord, without being fully engaged in the Lord's service, will be very difficult for us to give up attachment to the to external pleasure. So there has to be that proper engagement in the service of Krishna. How are we going to come to that? Where are we going to get that kind of service to the Lord? We have to develop taste in hearing and chanting and in worshipping the Lord and doing these different devotional activities. And this will t keep us away from the pleasures of the material senses. So in this way, Lord Krishna is describing how to come to Sthita Buddhi. Then text 22, very nice verse, often quoted. Yehi samsparsha japoga Dukha yonaya evati adhyanta vanta kontiya nateshu ramate buddha. An intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery, which are due to contact with the material senses. O son of Kunti, such pleasures have a beginning and an end, so the wise man does not delight in them. I ask you, I will ask the class here to consider, have, have you had the realization, did you have the opportunity to realize this, that material pleasures have a beginning and an end? Sorry. Yes, can you tell me Prabhu what happened, that you realized this? Any places when I was trying to realize uh, my increase in pay at my work, right? Whenever I had increase or increment or a promotion, I felt happy. But again, that stayed for a very, very few days, and again, it went into the miseries which come with along with that uh, thing. And then again, <clears throat> you get another thing, and this thing keeps going on and on. It never, so it, it is temporary. It starts, and then it, it definitely ends very soon. And then you look forward, and you do a lot of effort to start another thing, and again it will end. So everywhere, my Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Krishna Premi. Have you realized the nature of material pleasure having a beginning and an end? Yes, Maharaj. Most of the time, sometimes. Uh, like uh, we buy a new cell phone, a handphone, we are very excited. And after a while, it's nothing, you know, it's, it's nothing. And same as what Prabhu says, you know, when you got a bonus or something, we are very happy. And after a while, the money just goes away. There's no, there's no continuity of the pleasure, it's, it ends. Yes. I, I, it's not like in the devotional service. There's no end to it. Yeah, devotional service. 
There's no yeah. end to it, right? <laughs> no end to it. <laughs> There's always more service to do. Mm -hmm. Very nice, yes. And so it, it, it's mentioned the intelligent person who doesn't take part in the sources of misery. The source of what is the source of misery? Due to contact with the material senses. This is the source. The misery is coming. The nature of material life, our material senses, they're going to give us misery. Are, you, are, we, are we all convinced about that? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Of course, we say, you know, we know it's true, but still at the same time, when we get the opportunity, when the opportunity comes for sense gratification, then it's not easy to just say no. Yes, Maharaj. That's habit, habit, because mind and senses are so habituated. But if we're conscious, we can still say no, maybe. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, if we're conscious, yes, we have to be conscious. That's right. Sometimes devotees, they will say, first we have to be conscious and then we become Krishna conscious. So first of all, there's consciousness. So if we're conscious of it, this contact with the material senses, is going to be a cause of misery. If we, if we remember that, if we are conscious of that, we will be very cautious in dealing with the senses. So the wise man does not delight in them. Those wise people Again, the intelligent person, they will know, be cautious, the material senses, we have to control. The tendency for sense gratification is very strong. We are conditioned souls, we've been here a long time, the material world, and we're trying to get out of the material existence. And it depends on how well we control the senses. So material pleasure is certainly a challenge for us. But Lord Krishna is reminding us the temporary nature of the sense objects. Certainly it's temporary. Hmm, temporary, you, you do well, maybe you do well in an exam, or you do well in a, in a, in a project, or a, an, an assignment. Hmm, but it's not that every time we'll do well, sometimes we're successful. And sometimes we're not. So devotees should be careful. When we do well, then how should we think? What should be our conscience? Huh? The mercy of the Lord. Yes. The mercy of the Lord. The mercy of the Lord, right. It's Krishna's mercy. That actually Krishna, I'm just the instrument in the hands of Krishna. Krishna is the doer. And I'm just simply the instrument in the hands of Krishna. And when we don't do well, then what should we think? It is because of my mistake or it is because of my wrongdoings that I'm suffering or going through. Or I didn't do well. So who's... Our, our Krishna is trying to teach me a lesson. I want to learn the lesson for this. Krishna's mercy again to teach me the lesson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can we say that uh, this is not for us? That's why Krishna is not giving us the, you know, the pleasure of doing this uh, kind of activity. 
Oh, <laughs> well, that's one way of being detached from the situation. It is that we weren't meant to do well. You know, just like maybe you're cooking, maybe you're cooking some uh -huh, and you know, and maybe you don't cook very well, or maybe you, 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 maybe you put too much salt, or maybe it's too spicy or something, or something goes wrong, you know, maybe you burn the, burn the milk or something, you know, maybe things go wrong, you know, you, you say, well, you know, Krishna didn't want me to do well. <laughs> right? No, Maharaj, that's not the case. <laughs> what should we think? It's because of my mistake, it's because of my stupidity. I didn't have proper focus that I'm doing it for the Lord, that is why it worked. Yeah, right. Also because of the material modes, I'm associated with my work is being affected by the modes. Oh yeah, we could blame the modes. It's all due to the modes, Prabhu. What can I do, Prabhu? It's all due to the modes, you know. <laughs> but we are associating with them. I am the one who is desiring that mode, and I am working in that mode. Yes. So I am responsible, but the mode is actually what is determining also the action, the results of action. There was a one. There was a one devotee. He was Prabhupada's god brother, and he used to cook for for all the devotees, and this was in uh, Krishna Balaram Mandir, in the very early years, there was this one Brahmachari from the Gaudiya Math, his name was Anand Babu, and sometimes he would come to our temple and he would cook for all the devotees, and he would cook very nice and devotees, we would all praise him that, oh Anand Prabhu, your prasadam is so good, and he would say, if it tastes good, then thank Krishna. And if it's not good, then you blame me. So like that, you know, that you, you also understand, we, we, have, we are responsible. If we do well, we give the credit to Krishna. And if we don't do well, we have to understand that I haven't been focused on Krishna. I haven't put my consciousness on Krishna, therefore I didn't cook very well, therefore nothing came out very good. So it's my fault. So, you know, we have to take responsibility sometimes when, when things are not good. And when things are good, the credit, we give the credit to Guru and Krishna. So like that, we don't don't rejoice. So we don't don't try to delight in the temporary pleasures of the material world. This is important. Oh. Reflect on an experience when you realize material sense pleasures have a beginning and an end. We hope you've all realized that. <laughs> Maybe some of us were still trying to realize that. But we, at least we, we know, we may not have realized it fully, but at least we know material sense pleasures have a beginning and an end. We want to realize it. And certainly we get a lot of practice, we get a lot of experience on it, everything. All the pleasures of material world are like this. They have a beginning and an end. So we, we should be very cautious about any kind of material pleasure. We should know it's not eternal. So we get constant experience of this. Going ahead, 23, 24, 25, 26, requirements for the attainment of liberation. So 23, before giving up this present body, if one is able to tolerate the urges of the material senses 
and check the force of desire and anger. He is well situated and is happy in this world. So before we give up this body, so that means now, while we still have this body, we have to tolerate the urges, right? The urges, the Vegas described in Upadesha Amrita about the Vegas, the urges of the material senses, the urge of the tongue to speak, the mind's demands, actions of anger urges of the tongue and the belly and the genital, these things they have to be, we have to tolerate them and we have to check the force of desire and anger. So of course this is uh, describing the path of the jnani, he certainly wants to practice these things, be very careful check the force. We, what about a devotee? How do we deal with desire? Do we check the force of desire? Do we want to stop desire? No, we engage oh our and We engage in the service of the Lord. Yes, have you got any good spiritual desires? Yes, For example, Maharaj, if like a um, spiritual desires like going to dam, you know. Go so to the dam. Malaysia from going to dam from Kuchi wants to fly over to dam. Isn't that just like a desire of a holiday? But instead of going holiday to Paris, New York, and heaven, we go to dam. You know, is that okay? It's a desire. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Purify your desire. Go to the holy dam instead of going to Paris and New York. Very good. Music, Maharaj, we have a desire to uh, sing or, you know, play instruments and those kind of desires we might have. That we can engage in the service of the Lord, we can sing for the Lord. Yes, very nice. Yeah, if you're a musician, we have so, so many musicians come to Krishna consciousness and they use their musical talents to perform wonderful kirtans for the pleasure of the Lord and the devotees. Yeah, very nice desire. So we want to engage our desires in Krishna's service. What about anger? The Hanuman and uh, they have engaged in Krishna's service. Yeah, if, if, if when we read the Ramayana, we read in the Ramayana, we read about Vishwamitra. And Vishwamitra is telling about Vishwamitra how he wanted to become a Brahmarshi, Brahmarishi, right? He, he, he was a Kshatriya. Initially he was a Kshatriya and then he was impressed by Vishista's power as a Brahmana. So he decided better to try and become a Brahmarishi. And so he, he, de he describes about the, his different Paths, what he tried to do to purify himself, to come to that stage of Brahmarishi. For because he was a king, he was a Kshatriya, so he did austerities for a while. They said, Oh, Brahma said, Okay, you're a Rajarishi. <laughs> he was a Rajarishi. They, but they didn't make him a Brahmarishi. He said, You're just a Raja, make you a Rajarishi, a sage among the kings. That wasn't enough for him. He wanted to become a Brahmana. So he had to go off and do more austerity. And then uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes it, Indra would send beautiful women like Menaka came to him and he got distracted and he was enjoying with Menaka for 10 years or something. And then after that, then he realized, oh, this is wrong and he sent her away. But then they sent another woman, they sent Ramba. And, you know, and he was a... And, but then he got angry, he got angry, that, <laughs> he got so angry that he cursed this woman Ramba to become stone. <laughs> His anger, you know, the force of anger. And because he'd been a Kshatriya, and so he had that anger there, the tendency there is sometimes to get very angry. So he tried, he wanted to check that force of anger. 
And then finally, it came to the point he'd been fasting and just eating fruits and roots for many, many years. And then, he, then they, were, they were going to feed him some rice and then Indra came and begged the rice. And he begged all the rice and there was nothing left for Vish Vishwamitra. But he didn't get angry. He controlled his anger. So then they said, okay, now you're a Brahma Rishi. They made him a Brahma Rishi. So, checking the force of anger, important for devotees. Uh, we have to be very careful. Bhagavad Gita describes three, three gates to hell. Lust, anger and greed. And every sane man must be careful to avoid these things. So anger, anger management is a very popular thing. A lot of people are they're attracted, they want to know, how can I do it? How can I control my anger? Because it's very easy for us sometimes to get carried away due to material attachment, we become bewildered, the force of anger. But so long as these forces are there, we won't be properly situated and we won't be happy. So. It's Check, it's not just checking the force of desire and anger. Where does anger come from? What's the cause of anger? Unsatisfied lust. Yes, right. And how do we check lust? How do we deal with lust? Stop contemplating of the object, sensory objects. What's the process given in the Bhagavad Gita? How to conquer over lust? Whereas the process given is param trishtva nivartate that uh, we try to uh, get a higher taste in performing devotional service so that this lower taste of lust automatically is controlled. Mm -hmm. Yes, but... And... Uh, Engaging so the senses in the service of the Lord Maharaj. What? Yeah. Engaging the senses in the service of the Lord. Engaging the senses in the service of mind the Lord. Mind and intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. Engaging the senses, mind and intelligence. Lord uh, Krishna, in the third chapter, in the third chapter where lust is discussed, Lord Krishna gives a process himself. He recommends regulating the senses. In the beginning, regulation of the senses is important. If the senses are not regulated, then it will be, will be more prone to lust and unsatisfied lust will give anger. And so it's important the senses should be regulated. Then Lord Krishna describes, we'll see in the sixth chapter, yogi should not eat too much, don't eat too little. It must be regulated. Don't sleep too much. Don't sleep too little. It must be regulation in eating, sleeping, mating, defending. Everything must be properly regulated. That will help us to check the force of lust. And then cultivating transcendental knowledge is important also. That transcendental knowledge will direct us to experience the higher taste. So we, we have to be very conscious and careful in this path to check the force of desire and anger. Okay, we'll go ahead. Prabhupada states, the happy state of a transcendentalist. If one wants to make steady progress on the path of self-realization, he must try to control the forces of the material senses. One must practice to control them before one gives up this material body. One who can do this is understood to be self-realized and is thus happy in the state of self-realization. It is the duty of the transcendentalist to try strenuously to control desire and anger. 
Oh, Prabhupada has put the adjective here strenuously to control desire and anger. So how much effort we have to make, we must really intensely endeavour to control this force of desire and anger. Certainly, desire, we've been in the material world a long time and we're conditioned, we have a nature to desire, we want sense gratification. And it's easy to get angry. We don't get what we want, things don't go our way, we get really upset about it. Maybe if you have children, then it's even more easier to get angry. If you're a mother or a father and you're dealing with young children, they can really make you angry sometimes. It's a real training for us to try to control these things. How to deal with it? What do you do when you get angry? If you do get angry, what are you going to do about it? Anyone? Depends on the level of anger, Maharaj. At some point of anger, if it goes to that far, it's very difficult to, I mean, you're not even conscious that what you're doing it has completely overcome you. But that's the level which, uh, which is uh, very dangerous. But in the initial levels, you can check by being conscious and you can try to, I generally try to chant the holy names of Krishna and then contemplate and try to see the reason for the anger and try to not avoid the situation well up front. So once the anger is there, it's difficult, but you have to avoid it up front. Yes, it's difficult. We have to take shelter of the holy name. Sometimes it's good also, you go out. Sometimes you're in a, in a room somewhere and you know in the tent there's anger there, there's conflict, tension. Better go out, get out of the house sometimes. Go out, go out for a walk, take your bead bag with you and go and chant extra rounds. It'll help you to get over the anger. We have to control the mind and understand this anger, this is not actually necessary. We have to really endeavour to conquer over these things, the force of desire and anger. So material desires, they're going to come from time to time. We're conditioned souls and we have to deal with it very carefully. So it's training constant practice and endeavour. We have to hear about the lives of the great souls, how they, did, how they became perfect, how they struggled, what they put up with. In the 11th canto Srimad Bhagavatam, you can re read about the Brahmana from Avanti Desh and how much he tolerated. So much abuse, so many insults, people were so nasty to him, he tolerated it, he accepted it. So we have to learn to control also our minds in a similar manner, to conquer over desire, material desires. We have to purify the mind. The more we are in Krishna Consciousness, the less we will have these things, desire and anger. We want to keep away from them. All right. For, further requirements for the attainment of liberation. Some from 24, then some, one from 25 and two from 26. So different qualifications are given. Text 24, let's read the verse. One whose happiness is within, who is active and rejoices within, 
and whose aim is inward is actually the perfect mystic. He is liberated in the Supreme and ultimately he attains the Supreme. All right, so we've quoted the different points, happy from within, actively enjoying within and aiming within. Right? One whose happiness is within, who's act, who is active and rejoices within and whose aim is inward is actually the perfect mystic. He is liberated in the Supreme and ultimately he attains the Supreme. So he's liberated. So, very, very elevated soul, not an easy position to take so much pleasure within and to be so detached from everything without. Text number 25 continues, those who are beyond the dualities that arise from doubts, whose minds are engaged within, who are always busy working for the welfare of all living beings and who are free from all sins achieve liberation in the Supreme. So we quote it, working for the welfare of all living entities. But the verse also mentions beyond the dualities that arise from doubts. The dualities that arise from doubts. You have doubts. You know, am I doing the right thing, chanting Hare Krishna, is this the right thing? Am I wasting my time studying Bhagavad Gita? Right there, we have these kind of doubts. So we have, to, we have to go beyond the dualities. And the mind is engaged within. The mind is engaged within, not without. The mind is often engaged without. We're looking around us, looking how to enjoy the senses but the mind is engaged within. So we're thinking about the soul, we're thinking about Krishna, we're thinking about the Supreme. And always busy working for the welfare of all living beings. So this is a very nice point. The devotees, we certainly care about the welfare of all living beings. And the highest welfare work is what? How can we work for the welfare of all living beings? What can we do? Give them Krishna consciousness. And how are you going to do that? By distributing books, by giving them transcendental knowledge. Yeah. By holy name, Maharaj. Yes, a holy name, by Sankirtan, right? Lord Chaitanya, his main preaching when he was in Jagannath Puri was Sankirtan. He only discussed philosophy for, with a few people, a few rare souls, Ramananda Rai, Swarup Damodar, Sikhi Mahiti. But generally, for the mass of people, Sankirtan, the holy name. So this is very, uh, yes? It is stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 11, Canto 6, chapter, uh, verse number I'm forgetting. So it is uh, written as. Uh, a cha chandal can be liberated even by just uh, if if uh, he uh, he gets listened to uh, a holy name. Then what to talk about those who are uh, 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 chanting it uh, sophisticatedly or very attentively? So uh, it gets automatically uh, liberated. Yes, and the quality of the chanting also will help. So chanting, nice kirtan, absorbing the mind in the holy name, very powerful. Good for us and good for all living entities who can hear the holy name. And then it also mentions who are free from all sins. So devotees, as devotees we should be free from all sins. We follow regulated principles, in this way we avoid all sinful life. Then text 26, those who are free from anger and all material desires, who are self-realized, self self-disciplined and completely, 
and constantly endeavouring for perfection are assured of liberation in the Supreme in the very near future. So, so this is like, you know, the last 20, text 24 and 25 were very advanced. This is something like more of a concession for us. Krishna is like encouraging us, you know, maybe I'm not able to get liberated. But Krishna says, well, just get free from anger and desire. Free from anger and desire. And try to be self-realized, self-disciplined. Constantly endeavouring. Oh, we can do that. We can constantly endeavour. I'm not perfect, but we can keep trying for perfection. Endeavouring for, per for perfection. Then we're assured of liberation in the very near future. Okay? So the text 26 is describing like that. Full control over the mind and who are self-realized. From the purport of 25, Prabhupada explains, when a person is actually in the knowledge that Krishna is the fountainhead of everything, then when he acts in that spirit, he acts for everyone. The sufferings of humanity are due to forgetfulness of Krishna as the supreme enjoyer, the supreme proprietor, and the supreme friend. Therefore, to act to revive this consciousness within the entire human society is the highest welfare work. So helping people to remember Krishna, this is important. Knowing Krishna as the supreme enjoyer, supreme proprietor, supreme friend. This is actual welfare work. Krishna Consciousness is superior to Astanga Yoga. Going ahead, text 27 and 28, Krishna is introducing Dhyana Yoga. A Krishna Conscious person, however, being always engaged in devotional service, does not risk losing his senses to some other engagement. This is a better way of controlling the senses than by the Astanga Yoga. So, Astanga Yoga, we're just sitting and meditating. But Krishna conscious person, always engaged in devotional service, he does not risk losing his senses. But if you sit and meditate, there's a risk, there is a risk. If you do the Astanga Yoga, there's a risk. But in Krishna Consciousness, it's much safer. We have a lot of engagement. And here's the final verse, the peace formula. Hmm? So, a person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the Supreme Lord of all planets and demigods, and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities, attains peace from the pangs of material miseries. What kind of friend, Krishna says, I am Suridam Sarvabhutanam. Surit, he wants how you shall be happy. Mitra, social friendship. Bandhu, official friendship, but surit, surit means one who actually desires good of his friend. So different terms are there for friendship, but surit, the real friend, actually desires good. Sincere friend, which you describe in English. So Krishna is surit. He's always expecting my good. How I shall be good, therefore he is canvassing me. Please, you surrender unto me. So Prabhupada is describing to us how Krishna is acting there in the, in the heart of the living entity as the super soul. How he's reminding us and 
trying to direct us, giving us knowledge. Please, you surrender unto me. He's always expecting that we should be good, trying to help us to come to him. Okay? So today we spoke about who is responsible for the suffering of the living entities. And we described that although Krishna is the supreme controller, he does not assume the, the, the results of the actions of the living entities. And the material nature itself is an acts, it may be the doer of activities, but it acts on the basis of the desire of the living entity. So the material nature under the desire of the living entity and sanctioned by the Supreme Lord acts. So the living entity himself is responsible for his own suffering and activities. Points relevant from personal application from text 19 to 26. Text 19 to 26 discussing about the vision of Paramatma and coming to the position of freedom from material desire, freedom from anger, control of the mind, coming to the position of sameness and equanimity. So we have spoke about how we could apply these things, how we can actually conquer over anger and how we have to deal with the mind. Then the true meaning of equal vision of a devotee. The true meaning of equal vision. Devotee will see everyone equally in the sense that everyone is part and partial of Krishna. At the same time we will see also there are different levels of devotees. It's not that we deal the same with everyone. We have to recognize the particular nature of every individual and the particular body which they have. So while we see everyone equally, at the same time we know that everyone's an individual, somebody's an Uttama Adhikari, someone's a Kanista Adhikari, someone's a Madhyam Adhikari, different levels of devotees. So well, they're all devotees, but at the same time there's individuality. Then the formula for peace, it's not that we are the best friend, it's not that we are the proprietor and the enjoyer, but rather Krishna is the best friend. Krishna is such a friend, he never leaves us. The other friends, they come and go. We had friends when we were in school, we had friends in college, you have a friend before marriage. Like that, so many different friends come and go. But the one friend who is always with us, life after life, birth after birth, in this material world, is Lord Krishna in the form of the Super Soul. And so when we recognize Krishna as the actual proprietor and the enjoyer, as, and as the best friend, then we will be peaceful then we can find actual peace of mind. The highest welfare work for ISKCON members, we said Sankirtan, Harinam Sankirtan. This is the ultimate welfare work for ISKCON devotees. Everyone should join the Sankirtan party, go to chant the holy name, distribute literature, of course, in the pandemic time, there may be so many restrictions, but somehow or other, you get a group of people together and make a group and, and read. You know, so many Zoom classes are going on. There's Zoom, there's Skype, there's Facebook. There's so many different groups. You can have a group, you can have your club and get people together and just 
read from Prabhupada's books and talk about Krishna consciousness. This is the highest work for all the devotees in ISKCON. We definitely want to try to take advantage of every opportunity to distribute Krishna consciousness. So even though the p pandemic situation is challenging, so many dangers are there, but if we use our intelligence, there's so many opportunities. Devotees are finding more ways to, to introduce Krishna consciousness. And I was reading Vyasa Puja offering by different devotees, and there was one devoted lady, Govinda Devi Dasi, she was Prabhupada's secretary in the very beginning of the movement. She, she and her husband, they came to Krishna consciousness when they were very young, they were students, they, they were in art college, but somehow they left college and they came looking for a spiritual teacher and they met Prabhupada and they became devotees. And Govinda Devi Dasi went on to become Prabhupada's secretary and she, she wrote a nice offering, I was reading her offering this year and she was describing how Prabhupada warned, she was, you know, de describing Prabhupada's predictions. Prabhupada warned this whole material civilization, it's not going to last. It's all going to fall apart. It, you can't go on like this with just, you know, economic development, more, we have to expand, we have to sell more goods, we have to produce more cars, more cars and faster cars and like the, you know, the whole idea of economic development is such a myth, it's such an illusion. And Prabhupada saw it all and he said, you know, it will never last, all of these things, it will fall apart one day. Just like the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the British Empire, all of these things, they all fell apart. And so also these different empires, the you know, Microsoft Empire and the, <laughs> all of these other companies, multinationals, which have their empires, they will all fall apart one day. And Prabhupada warned us, he said, he said, don't be worried, he said, the preaching will improve. He said, as, as, the, as the modern civilization falls apart, then the preaching will improve. It will make the field more fertile for giving Krishna consciousness. So we're we're ready. We, we're just waiting. We're all ready. And we're practicing and we're taking every opportunity now, as the modern civilization is crumbling and falling apart. We're we're just looking for more and more opportunities to preach and to give Krishna consciousness, because we know this is the ultimate welfare work for everyone. Okay, here's Prabhupada's quote. The Eightfold Yoga mysticism is automatically practiced in Krishna consciousness because the ultimate purpose is served. Well, the, the Eightfold Yoga mysticism is practiced in Krishna consciousness. The ultimate purpose of the Eightfold Yoga system is Samadhi, where the mind is fixed in Krishna. So that is Krishna Consciousness. So the ultimate purpose of the yoga is, ach is achieved by Krishna Consciousness. Anyway, we will discuss more about the Eightfold Yoga process tomorrow, when we meet tomorrow. And we'll go through quite a portion, a major portion of the chapter, up to text number 36. So if you have a chance, you may look over it. Okay, are there any questions? Anybody? Any comment or question? Anyone? Hare Krishna Maharaj Yes, Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Bhakti Priya Mataji, if you want to. Yes, Bhakti Priya uh, Mataji. Uh, my question you were you were saying spiritual desire i also have spiritual desire to welcome you at our home because when whenever you come to delhi you go to base to janarayan prabhuji this time you come to our home 
<laughs> you welcome you. Thank you very much. That's a good a good reason to go to Delhi. <laughs> Where are you? Are you also in Noida? Greater Noida? No, we are uh, nearby the airport. Oh, near the airport. Oh, okay. You're out there beside what is it, Rohini, is it? No, it's Basant Vihar. Okay. All right. So it's convenient. Have somebody near the airport. Very useful. <laughs> yes, Farad. We will be happy to welcome you to South Bay. If I ever get traveling again, I don't know if everything, when everything will ever open up. <laughs> Seems to be a long way away. Situations. Yes, yes, not, not much changes. Anyway, thank, thank you very much for the invitation. Very kind. You are always welcome. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Okay. Anybody else? Any Hare other? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, regarding desires, we also saw that uh, in the second chapter, like, you know, like the uh, multiple rivers entering the ocean, we had that example. So, Maharaj, when, how do we understand that sometimes we have to let the desire pass and sometimes we have to purify it? Like, is, is there a way to understand it or, or how does that uh, work? Well, if we're engaged in Krishna consciousness, you know, we're active in Krishna's service, but in the course of your activity, some material desire comes into your mind, then certainly you're not going to give attention. You, you don't want to take up the material desire and give up your Krishna conscious activity, right? So the desire comes in the mind. We have to understand this is my, I'm not, I have to bring my mind more focused on Krishna and not let my mind drift away into material thoughts. We have to bring the mind, constantly bring the mind back. Wherever it wanders, we must bring it back. So it's like that, that we want to be always engaged in Krishna's service. And that means also the mind engaged in Krishna's service. So if the mind is bringing up some thought of material desires, it means our mind is not properly focused. And we have to focus the mind, get the mind in, under control. And how to do that? Well, chanting Hare Krishna or remember some slokas. You can recite like the Yehi Samsparsha Japoga Dukha Yonayevate, remembering the temporary nature of material pleasure. These things, we should, you know, build up a a storehouse of these different slokas to defeat our material desires. One of our devotees used to describe, he say, we're training our gladiators. He described the devotees as gladiators. You know a gladiator? They're like the Roman soldiers, you know, they go out there and they fight big lions with their swords. He said, we're training our gladiators to conquer the mind in the arena of japa so yeah. by intense japa we can conquer the mind and we bring it back from so thoughts of sense gratitude and the mind you know I, I often give the example about the mind that it's like a wild animal how do you train a wild animal did you ever capture a wild animal and try to train it you know there's a process when they capture the lion or something, how they train, they put it in a cage and they starve it and then they beat it and then they feed it. So then the lion becomes very careful because he understands this person put me in this cage. They left me in this cage for so many days, I was starving. And then he came and beat me, now he's feeding me. I better do what he says. So this way we have to beat the mind. Do you know how you beat the mind? With Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Maharaj said, with the shoe and with the broom. Yes, but how do you do that then? By repeatedly, you know, uh, uh, trying to give the positive reinforcement repeatedly, you know, like saying, just, you know, this is what you have to do, this is what you have to do, this is what you have to do. Right. You have to do what the mind doesn't want to do. 
The mind says, oh, no, don't chant, oh, the mind says, oh, no, don't go to Mongol RT, you need rest, you know, you'll look better, you know, if you have a good night's rest, you know, you'll look good, you know, have more rest. And the mind says, oh, God, don't wear a sari, oh, no, come on, you know, and the, the mind will say so many things, you know, we have to, we have to just conquer over the mind. You have to under, you get the mind to do what it doesn't want to do. The mind said, oh, it's too cold, don't take bath this morning. Okay, I'm going to take bath. You're going to take cold water bath, you know. <laughs> just like that, just to conquer the mind. Yeah? We have to train the mind like that. This is beating the mind, and starving the mind, starving the mind. You don't give it sense gratification and then feed the mind. We give it Krishna Consciousness, right? Now we're going to chant. Now we're going to go for Kirtan. And so, like that, this is how we have to train the mind. And so it's, it's, it's an endeavor, but it's very joyful to get, through, to get the mind. Because the, the mind has never made us happy. We've been trying for so long, trying to conquer, we've never been happy. But when we actually conquer the mind, then we will be happy, then we will experience peace. And without peace there's no possibility of happiness. So we have to apply this peace formula. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you. So we'll see you tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.